Let's get to our text, Hebrews chapter 10. I dare say today is going to be a hot sermon. That because we're going to lay out the Word of God, but for those that didn't figure it out, the air conditioning's broke. <laughs> amen. What we do for the Lord, amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. And let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promises is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more, as you see the day approaching. Right here we see the scripture admonishing us, do not miss church. Amen? And there's a reason, because the interaction at church is supposed to be something very special. He says in verse 4 right here, let us consider how we may spur on one another towards love and good deeds. Now, very interestingly, the word spur in the Greek is the word paroxymus. And in different translations, it translates words to move one another, to excite one another, arouse one another, stir up one another, incite one another, stimulate one another. But the most often used translation for this word is provoke one another to love and good deeds. And seems a bit negative there. To provoke one another. Sounds like your kids a little bit, doesn't it? Well, very interestingly, this word's only used two times in the New Testament. Once here in the book of Hebrews and the other in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 15 and verse 39, it says that Paul and Barnabas had such a sharp paroxysmus clash that they parted company. Wow. So this is, that has that sense of challenge right there. And of course, we, we understand as true disciples of Jesus that Jesus' ministry and therefore our efforts with one another simply can be summed up in these words. Is to Disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. And right here, we, we understand the book of Hebrews is written actually to people who had been Christians for many, many, many years. And what had happened is the value of meeting together had begun to drift from their minds and their hearts. And so consequently, right here, the writer of the Hebrews is reminding them. He says, Bottom line, let us consider how we may spur one another on, provoke one another to love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. You know, we understand that in Acts chapter 2, the disciples met every day. Amen, guys? And we talked about last week in Hebrews chapter 3 that we need to have daily contact with disciples. It's just not come to church, sing a couple songs, get entertained, and then last amen, go on out and live your life as you would. As disciples of Jesus, we live for him 24-7. Amen, guys? Now, here in this particular congregation, we have some meetings of the body that are extremely important. Of course, we have Sundays, then we have Wednesdays, we have Bible talk, and we have devotional. One is not prioritized over the other. And sometimes people think, well, yeah, I know i got to be there on Sunday, but I don't know about Wednesday night. No, no, when the body comes together, that's a meeting of the body, and that's our priority. See, what had happened to these people that had been Christians for a real long time, they had forgotten that the church was the very kingdom of God. Man, when you say, man, I'm coming into the kingdom of God, of which God had prepared for centuries, then you go, wow, it's so awesome to be at church. And it doesn't make any difference if it's Sunday morning or if it's Wednesday night or if it's Bible talk. You guys with me right here? You know, the idea of spurring one another, though, I think sometimes bothers us. The Spirit says in he, uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, he says, we are to speak the truth in love to one another. See, this sometimes provokes us a little bit. You know what I'm talking about? Someone that loves you more than the relationship itself. 
And see, we live in a time where it's peace, peace. Sadly, even in the church. And bottom line, we got to get a conviction as disciples of Jesus that we love our brother more than we love peace in the relationship. Because we want them to get to heaven. You know, it's, it's kind of that time of year again when the flu hits. Have you noticed? Elaine and I kind of traded this one kind of flu back and forth for about a month. And then last night we kind of sneezed and coughed while we were around Jack and Jeannie's house. <laughs> and Jeannie says, yeah, when you leave, we're, we're taking the vitamin C. I go, amen, sis. <laughs> and it's very interesting to me how people look at sickness. A lot of times people say, oh, I'm, I'm sick. I, I really need to take care of myself. I won't be able to come to church. But you know something? They'll be out of bed at 5 o'clock in the morning and at work right on time. Yeah. Now let's figure this one out. Which is more important in the eyes of God? Seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness or a job? Wow. Like we need to lay this on out right here. I'm a little bit sick this morning. Hey, Amen. No, no big deal. Hope you don't get my sickness. But if you do, amen, I expect to see you here next Sunday. <laughs> and we, we got to get a conviction that this is the kingdom. And if someone misses, it's concerning. Now, maybe they're wicked sick and they're on their back dying. A amen. We need to go over and visit them. Maybe they got a flat tire on the way here and obviously couldn't be here. Amen. But a lot of times, people miss because there's something spiritual going on. And it boils down to that Jesus Christ was not their number one priority. That's why when people miss constantly, whether it be for a job or whether it be for health or for family issues, we understand that the Bible categorizes, categorizes these people as weak Christians. Even if they've been around a long time, they are weak Christians. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But we need to get a conviction that as people who want to follow Jesus Christ, we're going to be here because God has called us to be with his people. Are you with me right here? And when we're with each other, we get a little provoking a little bit, don't we, a little bit right there? And we come out of here and we become stronger and encouraged because we've had the kind of fellowship that isn't just, hey... How's your favorite baseball team doing? Hey, are your stocks falling as much as mine? We're here to talk about our spiritual lives. Are you with me here, church? You know, a couple that I, that I love with all my heart is uh, Lordy and Samir Friendsley. Amen? They live clear out in Palm Springs. And uh, the last time I was out there, I said, you know, I, I'm going to clock on my odometer how far they have to come to church. So from their place... To the quiet canyon here is exactly 125 miles. It takes them two hours to get here. Now, there are a lot of other churches between here and there. But why do they come all the way here? Because they really believe there's something here that they cannot find between Palm Springs and here. We're talking about a church where people are called to be sold-out disciples of Jesus Christ. We're talking about a church that is absolutely a church that loves one another. Amen, church? We're talking about a church that has a mission to evangelize the world in a generation where we're involved in everybody's life, discipling them so they can be mature in Christ. And we need to get a conviction. That's worth driving for. And bottom line, Jesus says, it's worth dying for. It's worth dying for. Spur one another on. Amen? Amen? Second point, laugh with one another. Now, I know you guys got this one down pretty good when I was trying to explain grace worldwide last week. It's not laugh at one another. It's laugh with one another. Okay, I wanted to break that down just a little bit for you guys right there. Let's go and see a picture of God's church in the first century. Acts chapter 2. Verse 1, these are the first Christians. Those who accepted this message were baptized, about 3,000 
were added to the number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to breaking bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with all many wonders, miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Well, we certainly see the devotion they had as far as being with each other every day. We see the devotion by selling their possessions so that everybody's needs could be met. But I think sometimes we kind of brush over the fact that the disciples had a good time being with each other. It was just a blast to be with the other disciples. You know, Luke just simply says they broke bread in their home. They had these awesome meals. And they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. That's just what disciples did. They just ate together. And they were fired up. They were so happy. Well, Luke explains this a little bit more in detail when he talks about the teachings of Jesus in the book of Luke, chapter 6. In verse 20, looking at his disciples, Jesus said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. So a lot of you guys are blessed out there today. Amen, guys? Blessed are you who are hungering now, for you will be satisfied. Maybe there's a, a few hungering out there. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their fathers treated the prophets. Let's focus here on the last part of verse 21. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. <laughs> of course, we understand that the weeping is over our sin. That the weeping is over Jesus' death for our sin. But because of faith and repentance and baptism, when we come out of those waters, we live in newness of life, and we are glad. We are fired up. It's not real unusual that we just start laughing. We are just so happy. Are you with me right here? You know, it's, 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 it's very amazing when you look to the scriptures and you see the joy that Jesus had. I think even his playfulness with the disciples. Remember the first time he met Simon. He says, Simon, I'm going to name you Peter. He gives him a nickname, a sign of affection. Now, for us English speakers, that little bit goes over our head. See, basically, Simon's real name was Simon Barjona. And in Hebrew, Bar means son of, Jonah means John. So if it was in the English language, that would be Johnson. And Peter means rock. So, I mean, if we were to see Simon Bar Jonah today, he'd be Rocky Johnson's. That's be his name. <laughs> and Jesus says, hey, you're Rocky. And there was a sense of affection, not too unlike our, our new brother, uh, Raul Garcia. Now, he was, he was baptized by Raul Marino. Uh, yeah. And so in order to distinguish the two there in, in Fulton, Raul Mar Marino christened him with the name Junior. It's a sign of affection. Or with like uh, Colleen Antelon, we call her Coco. Now why we do that, I don't know, but amen, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a nickname. It's, it's a sign of affection. You know, it's interesting uh, to be able to have the Wilsons and several of the uh, uh, San Francisco crew down here. It is exciting, amen, church? And we were just talking a little bit, and I was asking Son a little bit about his, his background, uh, Son and, and Tanya. And uh, Son was saying, well... You know, probably before I became a Christian, I uh, owned some nightclubs. I go, okay. And my wife, was, she was a real high-powered model, Tokyo, Bangkok, Hong Kong. And, uh, well, praise God. You know, I, I became a disciple. I said, well, tell me a little bit about that a little bit more. And he says, well, he says, actually, I owned a pretty famous uh, nightclub 
uh, in San Francisco called Berkeley Square. And right, right about then, Larry Wilson goes, yeah, I used to go to it before I was a Christian. <laughs> and, now, and now we see that the trans are joining the remnant group led by the Wilsons. And you got you to gotta go, that's incredible how the Holy Spirit orchestrates the times and the places so that men would seek God, reach out for him, and find him dashed with a little humor. <laughs> and isn't it amazing that here son had this dent of iniquity that Larry seemed to frequent. <laughs> and, and now we all just take a step back and we see that Larry is leading the church there and your son leading his family back to God. And, and you got to admit, that's worth a good laugh. See, our mourning will turn to laughter. Because God has forgiven our sins. And he's forgiven us so much that when we look back at our old life, it doesn't even look like us. As a matter of fact, it seems so far distant, the change is laughable. Let's go on to our third point. Judge one another. Now, you know, in, in evangelical circles, they go, oh, no, 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 judge not lest ye be judged. And they said, that's what Jesus said. Well, sort of. Let's go see. Let's straighten out what Jesus said right here. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7, verse 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now right here, Jesus once more employs a little bit of humor to make a point. His point is against hypocritical judgment. And he says, isn't, isn't, wouldn't it be ridiculous if you're looking at your brother and you go, bro, I see a speck in your eye. And you say, let me go and get that. And you swing around this two by four. <laughs> and you're trying to get his little tiny speck out. You know what I'm talking about right here? Notice what he says. When you do repent and take out the two by four, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to take that speck out. Let's move to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Isn't it amazing that the denominational world could have twisted scriptures to mean just the opposite of what Jesus spoke? That should shock us. In 1 Corinthians 5, we have these words. Paul says in verse 1, It's actually reported there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that does not occur even among pagans. A man has his father's wife, and you're proud. Shouldn't you rather be filled with grief and have pulled out of your fellowship the man who did this? Even though I'm not physically present, I'm with you in spirit. And I've already passed judgment on the one who did this just as if I were present. Drop down, verse 9. I have written to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters. In that case, you have to leave the world. But now I'm writing you, you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral, greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. What business is the mind to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. If any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before ungod the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, 
Are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have a dispute about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. I say this to you, shame you. Is it possible that there's nobody among you who's wise enough to judge the dispute between believers? But instead, one brother goes to law against another brother, and this in front of unbelievers. Paul's saying, number one, we need to get along. Amen, guys? And number two, he's saying, hey, we need to have the wherewithal, the judgment, to be able to discern how to put people back together. And bottom line, he says, listen, we need to judge one another's life or to hold each other accountable for the kind of life that we have. Why do so many churches have hypocrisy in them? Because no one is holding their brother accountable. We are our brother's keepers. That's what the truth is. You know, in our congregation here, we have a, a methodology to, to help this, and that's called discipleship partners. We talked a little bit about it last week. Every member who, who becomes a member here, whether by baptism or restoration or placing membership, gets a discipleship partner. And we always ask them, hey, who would you like to disciple you? And if that person is strong enough and has the time, then we, we always give them that person. But if that's not really the right person, then we say, you know something, you really need to be discipled by someone like this so that they can grow in the Lord. I think a lot of people kind of miss the point of discipleship partners. Yes, we should have a good time and, you know, eat with glad and sincere hearts. But having a meal together is not just discipleship partner times. Discipleship partner times is basically this. If you're the older disciple... You're looking at the, the younger disciple, and you're looking at Jesus, and you're saying, okay, Jesus is this way. The younger disciple is this way. Now, what needs to change? You know, there's always a lot to talk about. And you know something? Even for people that have been around the kingdom 10, 20, 30 years, there's still stuff to talk about. You know, I've heard it said, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. That just isn't true. That just isn't true. And for some of the older men in the congregation, and sisters too, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to infer you were like an old dog or anything. We need to understand, not only can we change, but God expects us to change. God expects us to become more and more like Jesus every day. And if you're not able to look back in a three to six month, year period of time and not see changes, then, then you're not growing and you're drifting away from God. You know, one of the brothers that uh, I know we all respect very much is Ron Harding. And uh, I remember when I, we first came down here to L.A., Ron goes, bro, I want to be in the ministry. And I go, hey, man. You know, a lot of different brothers that always come up and say, bro, I want to be in the ministry. I go, hey, man, bro, that would be good. We'll, we'll see if you really want to be in the ministry. And, you know, and Ron and I have talked about this many times. Ron is, has an IT background. And you know how IT people tend to be. Just level, monotone when they speak, you know, all this, you know. And I said, you know something, Ron, that's a, that's a great vision. But, you know, if, if, you're going to, if you're going to be a preacher, you're going to have to make some major changes. Now, Ron is getting near 40. And for a lot of you, that's an old dog. And you know something? Ron was humble. Didn't matter who discipled him. He was a learner. As a matter of fact, when things were a little bit uncertain after Kyle went back to Hawaii, he called up Ken Zindler and said, Ken, I know you're in the ministry. Dude, I need to be discipled if I'm going to make it as a preacher. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit worked it on out that Alain and I worked with the Hardings along with the Morenos when uh, Morenos first came here to Orange County. And we, I was able to disciple Ron and, and work with them more closely during that time period. And, and the thing that's exciting is to be able to see this man make some radical changes in how he comes across. How he deals with his temper. 
how he deals. And, and you know how sometimes quiet guys just kind of have a storm brewing down here and then <laughs> it just explodes? I mean, and, and, and to see Ron change these things is incredible. And it's just, I mean, it just even brings a tear to my eye that today is his first Sunday as the preacher in the Portland International Christian Church. Is that awesome? And the thing that's, the thing that's exciting, the thing that's really exciting about it is that he called me this morning. He says, bro, we're having a great Sunday. We're having a great Sunday. I said, well, tell me about it. He says, we have 11 placing membership and two baptisms. That's a pretty good first Sunday, don't you think, church? See, we, we need to understand that, that, that God uses us when we submit to God's plan. Yes, we're discipled directly by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. But God's plan is also to humble us to be discipled by men and women. Are you with me right here? So, judge one another. Now, our fourth point is, do not judge one another. Bro, are you contradicting yourself one point later? No, 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 no. Let's, let's, let's go to Romans chapter 14 right here. Romans 14. Verse 1. Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything. But another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. For God has accepted him. He, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or he falls. And he will stand. For the Lord is able to make him stand. Now we are to hold each other accountable for life. And doctrine issues. For it says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, that we need to watch our life and our doctrine closely, and we need to persevere in them because it's needed to save both ourselves and our hearers. But there are some things that are disputable matters. Of course, the one that's raised right here is food. And of course, in the congregation, we all know we've got the vegetarians and we've got those people with the Body for Life diet and the Adkins diet and the, the seafood diet. That's when, whenever you see food, you eat. That's a seafood diet. But the thing that had begun to happen right here is that the people in the church had become hypercritical of one another. And, and this, this hurt because in love, we accept each other. Lord, We don't accept sin. We don't accept something that, that cuts a person off from God. But we need to, to have a sense of grace and mercy with each other, no matter what someone eats or how they wear their hair, whether it be balded or with dreadlocks or just plain good-looking 60s style. We need to be careful when we're judgmental about the length of time someone takes a vacation. We need to be careful. We need to be careful about whether or not we think purest ears for guys are the way to go. Or maybe a tattoo for the ladies. These are disputable matters. And if you become hypercritical of each other, you will destroy each other's faith. You know, I know when I, when I first came to the church, when I was 17 and I was in college, it, it hit me. It was so awesome that I came into a church where there was black, white, Asian, and Latin. And, and it didn't matter how you dressed. Now, back in those days in the 60s, a lot of people went to church and they were court and tie. You were expected to. But this church, you could walk in with flip-flops, you'd come in with shorts, and, and, and you were totally accepted. And you know something? It, it, just, it just stood out. Wow. This is a church that loves God and clearly accepts the differences in one another. Are you with me right here? So, biblically speaking, we need to judge one another, and we need to not be hypocritical in our judgment or overly judgmental because that will destroy our faith. As Paul said in Galatians 5, 6, I love this scripture. The only thing that counts 
is faith expressing itself through love. Now, we know the Holy Spirit inspired that passage. Amen, church? So, he's saying, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. That's what we need to be about as disciples. As we live for God. Interacting with other disciples as well as interacting with the lost. Point five. Partners with one another. Philippians chapter one. See if you don't feel Paul's heart right here for the brothers and sisters at Philippi. Verse 3. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. For whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. I mean, do you you sense how much he loved them? And see, that bond of love came not simply because Jesus says, you know, you must love one another as I have loved you. But one of the things that bonded them was being partners in the gospel, is reaching out to lost people and sharing the grace that had been given to them. You know, God is genius, if you didn't know. And, you know, we understand the need for evangelism because without Jesus Christ, all men are lost. Amen? But God made our mission to be to seek and save the lost to reach out to lost people so that in sharing our faith, we would be reminded of that grace every day. Is that awesome? And so the person you see that's not sharing their faith, they're the individuals that over time they begin to drift as far as their appreciation of the grace of God. And they become proud and they become hard-hearted. They become unfruitful. And in time, they'll fall away. You know, look what he says about Timothy in chapter 2, in verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. He says, that's the kind of tight relationship. Paul says, because we had worked to win other people to Christ, there was a bond that we shared, like a father and a son. You know, as I just kind of uh, looking out here, I I still remember just even a few weeks ago, uh, Javier inviting me to uh, jump into the last couple of studies uh, with Eddie Alvarado. And, uh, you know, Javier, I I love Javier ever since he's placed membership, but we're not particularly close. But you know what, what began to draw us closer was just that one study that we had with Eddie over a meal Remember, eat with glad and sincere hearts. Amen, guys? Where we got into the word of God, and we, and we, we called Eddie to give up everything. And there's just something special. And then to see him baptized. I mean, just, it, it just knits your soul together when you're working together to help other people change their lives. You know, I was so excited uh, this past weekend that the uh, Martinez's got a chance to go on out to Honolulu, Hawaii, and preach for the church out there. And uh, it was really awesome because uh, Kathy was asked to do the women's day there. And, of course, the Bethalmios, Kyle and Joan Bethalmio, lead the church in, in Honolulu. They are doing fantastic out there. And uh, it was awesome. So Kathy was the main speaker for the women's day. She and Joan had worked side by side uh, here as uh, regional leaders in the L.A. church. Well, when they got out there, it was awesome. They had 17 women disciples, and they had 28 visitors at Women's Day. And then they had so many studies that were set up. I mean, it's just like Joan and and Kathy and all the sisters just going at it, setting up studies, going after it. And there was such an awesome bond that they felt.
because they were working to win souls together. Are you with me right here? And then Lena shared with me just uh, yesterday, she says, oh, hon, I, I got this, I, I got this incredible email from Helen Sullivan. For those that don't know, uh, here in the congregation, we support Matt and Helen Sullivan down in Santiago, Chile as missionaries. And uh, Matt and Helen, we trained them when we were in the church in Portland and then sent them out. They planted the church there in Phoenix. And then after two years, they went on down to Santiago. And so we were partners in the gospel there in, in Portland. But the thing that was awesome, Helen just we got this incredible email. She said, Lena, it was so awesome. I was out on the campus today. Now, you got to understand, Helen's about 40 years old. <laughs> and she's out there. So she's fired up for the Lord. Amen, guys? She's out there. She says, I met this incredible young lady. She was so fired up. And we asked her to study. She says, yes, I really want to study. I really want to study. She says, but I got to ask my mom. And Helen says, I just felt kind of my heart sink, you know. Well, the girl went back and talked to her mom. Turns out her mom is a fallen away disciple. She says, you need to study with these people. And tell them your mom wants to study too. <laughs> and then the mom told a story. She says, you know, I ran into these true Christians about as many years as you've been born. At that time, I was having trouble with my boyfriend. And I'd become pregnant. And I was going to get an abortion. But because of studying the Bible, I had you. You have life because I became a disciple. Now I want you to have that life, and I want us to have it together. Now, you see, there's a bonding of mom and daughter there. But there's a bonding now between Elena and Helen. Even though Helen is 10,000 miles away, you're still partners in the gospel. And though I don't know the name of that woman and the daughter, I rejoice greatly. Because I know we're winning souls. We're winning souls up here in this hemisphere, and they're down there in that hemisphere. And we're connected. Amen, guys? I just got to ask you some straightforward questions here. How many studies did you get in this past week? Or did affairs of job, household, marriage, or family totally consume your time? If you did not get on any studies, well, perhaps it was because your studies canceled. Amen. That happens to us all. But I'm talking about that you didn't even schedule them. I'm telling you, I want to challenge you. Get into at least one study. Two, it would be preferable, this week, and see if your whole perspective doesn't change about your life. When you get into non-Christians' lives, you go, man, do they have so many problems. My life is awesome compared to them. I have a flat, awesome life. But, you know, if we just hang around by ourselves, we go, oh, man, my life's terrible. It's awful. Stock market's crashing. My husband wasn't nice to me three days ago. And, you know. But you, you get into non-Christians' lives, you go, oh, my gosh, you need the Lord. And I got to tell you about my life. I got to tell you about my life. And, and, and that's why, isn't, isn't God genius right there? And then not only that, but then when you do it with somebody, you go, hey amen. Amen. This thing together, you know. Yeah. You and me. Yeah, I got you. I feel you. And there's that, there's that, there's that bond right there. But you see, I'm afraid that some of us have gotten so busy, we've cut out getting in on studies. I talked to one particular brother, really super great-hearted brother, and I'm not going to mention Nick's name publicly because, you know, these are the kind of things that we try to keep between brothers and everything. All jokes aside, all jokes aside, Nick, uh, Nick's my best friend, and uh, um, Nick, Nick and Denise are very conscientious as a shepherding couple. And they have gotten into so many people's lives helping them. And, and many of you know they've gotten into your life. And uh, that's why I'm equally excited about Jack and Jeannie. They're going to be powerful up there in the north. But, uh, you know, uh, I just talked to Nick. I said, well, bro, you know, you still got to make your Bible talk work. Even if it means cutting out a few of these 
so-called necessary shepherding appointments, you've got to be focused in on the mission. And of course, Nick's an awesome disciple, and and uh, you know he, he you know he has the heart for God, and and he recognized that was true, and you know there was a sense of resolve. Yeah, you know something, I've got to get into studies, I've got to start getting things moving, I've got to get my own Bible, uh, business to Bible talk. This is what we've got to do, and I think. You know, we need to understand that probably right now in your life, you have the least amount of responsibility you're ever going to have. You go, no. <laughs> you mean it gets worse than college? Yes, it does. You get married, then you have kids. I said, but don't, isn't there less problems after you have kids? No, then they grow up, and then you have a lot of problems. And then you get grandkids. I mean, to tell you, it gets challenging. Right now, you have the least, so you better figure out how to be evangelistic, how to be fruitful, how to get those studies fit into your schedule. Are you with me right here? And it may be a matter of not cutting out something bad because you're trying to live as a good disciple. It may be that you simply need to cut out some of the good things you're doing so that you can have an impact on souls and study with them, be partners in the gospel, and be fruitful for Jesus Christ. Are you with me here, church? Let's go to our next point. Pray for one another. In James 5, we, we brushed up against this scripture last week. In verse 16, it says, Therefore confess your sins to each other. Remember that one? Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it didn't rain on land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. Wow. Well, he's saying right here, first of all, you got to confess your sins. You, you, you have to have a life that's transparent. I don't care who you are, you need to have people in your life. You need to be open. You need to have a few people in your life where you're open with your sins, your temptations, how your marriage is going. Yeah, even how the sex life's going or not going. You need to talk to someone when, when you're having lust issues, when you're worried and concerned about finances. Someone needs to know where, where your finances are at. I mean, we need to be transparent to at least a couple of people so that people are in our lives. And if you're not, you're going to be burdened. And so he says right here, you need to confess your sins. And then, look at this, it's so cool. Then you can pray for each other. For the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And he cites Elijah, get this, as a man just like us. Now, we don't think ourselves to be just like Elijah, but the scriptures say he's just like us. He prayed, God, do not let it rain. And for three years, it didn't rain. And he goes, God, let it rain. And then it rained. That's a cranking prayer life. Do you not agree? <laughs> Let's see if we can understand this a little bit better. Let's turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 8. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sense of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And the church said, He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and He will deliver us. On Him we've set our hope that He will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Wow. Do you you understand this? Paul says, man, I I want you to know what's going on in my life. I don't want you to be uninformed. I want to be transparent. He says, you know all about hardships. You know all about my suffering. You know the pressure I was under. I didn't know if I was going to be able to live. I was so scared for my life. He says, and I understand why these things happened so that I might not rely on myself, but on God. But I want you to know, and then this, isn't this incredible right here, what he says? He says, on him we've set our hope, verse 10, that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf to the gracious favor grant us in answer to the prayers of many. Wow. Paul was able to endure the hardships, the suffering, even his, his fear of death, 
Because the prayers of brothers and sisters made a difference. Do you believe your prayers are going to make a difference? Let me look at Elijah. Three years, no rain, then pray, rain. Wow, that makes a difference. But right here, Paul's saying in, 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 in his ministry, it made a difference that someone prayed. Made a huge difference. You know, uh, a month ago when the San Francisco crew came on down, and we appreciate them coming down, they come down about once a month. They brought down a, a couple that was trying to be restored, uh, Gary and Shelley Watkins. And Lynn and I had the privilege of being with them. And yes, we ate with glad and sincere hearts. <laughs> but about a week ago, we got an email from the Wilsons that said that uh, Shelley, they took a, a brain scan of the front lobe right here of her brain, and it, it was all clouded. There was blood, and it looked like they may be tumors there. And the word went out. Pray for Shelly. I emailed Bass. I said, we're praying. I'll tell Lena. She's praying. I know they shot out to a lot of people. There were a lot of disciples praying everywhere. Just two days ago, she went back to the doctor. Everything was totally cleared. The doctor goes, well, I guess it was a miracle. <laughs> I guess. See, we need to understand, guys. This is real. Life is real. God is real. Hardships, suffering, pressure beyond what you can endure, the fear of death. You need to be praying. Yeah, pray for yourself and the hardships and the sufferings and the pressure, but, but pray for other people. It makes a difference. I, I, I have this habit. I, sometimes when I see a homeless person and, and I'm maybe driving by in a car, I just do a shoot, quick prayer. It says, Lord, do something special in his life today. I don't know how that prayer is going to affect it, but I believe it's going to do something. We need to be praying for those that are weak in the congregation. Why? Makes a difference. We need to be praying for those friends and family that have fallen away. It makes a difference. If you're not praying, God can't act. You know, there are three... Prayers that I thought about as a congregation, we need to be praying because some of our brothers and sisters have been doing hardship. I mentioned Samir and Lloyd traveling 125 miles. You know, we really need to get a house church going out there in Palm Springs. We need to be praying that God raises up a house church leader level couple to move on out to Palm Springs, either inside of our church or from some place so that we can have a house church every Sunday morning out there. We need to be praying about that. We need to be praying about the same thing in San Diego. We got a group of disciples down there that Lance and company ministers to on Sunday night, but that's so tough. We need to have a house church leader level couple that says, listen, I'm going to stand in the gap. I'm going down there. We're going to have a cranking service. Then the third thing I'd like to raise before the congregation for the first time, and that's that we start a cross and switchblade ministry in South Central LA. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I put this on my prayer list. About uh, three days ago. And I started praying that morning. I said, you know, the Lord put on my heart. We've got to have a, a cross switchblade ministry. For those that don't know about it, it goes back to New York City. And uh, this uh, one minister reached out to a lot of the troubled gang members and, and um, drug users and prostitutes in, in New York City. And I, I read the book, and I was very moved by it. And so many years ago here in L.A., we started across the Switchblade ministry. And uh, I was very privileged to, 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 to be a part of it. And, and uh, a young disciple couple, we had asked to lead it, Corey and, and Megan Blackwell. And I still remember Corey and Megan coming over to the house. Corey played in the NBA, and Megan was a model. And uh, I said, you know, I know things have been tough there for you. But you know something? We have a new ministry starting, and I'd like, I'd like for you to be in it called the cross and the switchblade. You know, bro, we'd, we'd like to, to, to be in it somehow. I said, well, well, not just somehow. I'd like for you guys to be the leaders. And they became the leaders. And we asked anybody that had a background of drugs or gang membership or prostitution to be a part of it. We had 18 people come together. And for a white guy from the suburbs, it was an education. <laughs> I remember I was doing first principles early on in the ministry. And one of the brothers coming up and says, bro, Johnny's doing bad spiritually. I go, hey, man, bro. He says, bro, you don't understand. Johnny's doing really bad. 
I mean, bro, okay. Well, what do you mean? Well, he's got a bad attitude towards you, what you tossed last week, and he's carrying a gun. Okay, now that redefines doing bad spiritually for me. <laughs> We've had a redefinition right here. I appreciate you sharing with me that Johnny's not doing well. I'm, we'll try to reach out to Johnny right now and take care of him. You know, it's interesting. When the Lord put this on my heart three days ago, I prayed for Corey. Corey and Megan have since divorced and gone through some very hard times. I prayed for Corey that, that day that, that, that the Lord would, would, would use him. I'm not kidding you. Two hours later, I haven't talked to Corey for so long. It's on my phone. Corey Blackwell. Whoa! So my, Corey! <laughs> and we're talking, and we just had this incredible talk. In the midst of the talk, though, he, he was sort of open about some of the things in his life. And uh, then he mentioned that his mom had been put into the hospital because of kidney failure. And she's out here in L.A. I said, okay, I'll go get her. Because she had become a Christian. She was Muslim in her background. And uh, so Corey and I talked. It was, it was a great talk. But I went to go see the mom over at the hospital then. And we just had this incredible talk. I come on in. And she goes, Kip. Says, and she starts crying. She says, I was praying. I was praying for somebody to go and help Corey. And I know it's you. And we just talked and we shared. She shared all the challenges that, that Corey's going. And, and you know, it, it occurs to me, isn't it an incredible thing to be an answer to a prayer? And isn't it an incredible thing to think that we have access to the very throne of God, to talk to God and say, God, we need a ministry in South Central Los Angeles that reaches out to those people that are really hurting, to the, to the gang members, to the drug users, to the prostitutes, to, to the people that are really hurting, and that God... We need you to raise up someone. We need you to raise up a group of people that got the guts, that got the faith to be willing to go down there and preach the word of God. And so, church, I want to put this on your prayer list. Number one, I want us to be praying for Palm Springs to get a house church. Amen, guys? Number two, to pray for San Diego to have a permanent house church leader. And number three, that we start a cross and switchblade ministry down in South Central Los Angeles. Are you with me right here? Last point, believe in one another. Go to Galatians chapter 6. Yes, Tony, this is point number seven. Verse 1. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Wow. He says right here, as, as, as brothers, we need to talk to each other gently about sin. Then, we need to carry each other's burdens. Why? So we will fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? That we love one another as he loved us. And so to do that is to help each other overcome sin. Is to help each other with the burdens of their life. In essence, to believe in them that they're going to make it. You know, one of uh, my favorite movies goes way back. It's uh, the second movie in the Star Wars series, The Empire Strikes Back. And I think most of us know the main characters there. You know, there's Darth Vader. He's the bad guy. You know, he's the guy with the breathing problem. Okay, that guy. And then, of course, we got Yoda. You know, he's the, 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 ultimate, the ultimate Jedi trainer. And then there's Luke Skywalker, the, the, the young kind of, you know, out of control Jedi Knight to be. And I'll never forget two scenes in it. One of the first scene had to do with Darth Vader, and, and he was trying to, to get Luke in company. And he had asked his admiral to do it, and he failed. And he turns to the admiral, and he goes, Admiral, you have failed me for the last time. And then all of a sudden, the force comes on the admiral. <laughs> like this, you know, it's just, he goes down like this, you know. <laughs> and you just see him plop. 
And then Darth Vader goes to the next guy in line. You're my new admiral. <laughs> oh, whoa. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and in the same movie, contrasted to that, Luke goes looking for Yoda in the Dagobah system. But he, he's coming on in, and to make a long story short, he crashes his uh, X-Wing fighter in this stinking swamp. Well, sure enough, he finds Yoda. And Yoda tries to, to help him on out. And, of course, be able to use the Force. And so one of the interactions goes, uh, Yoda comes up to him and he says, Lost yet? Oh, no. We'll never get it out now, talking about the X-Wing fighter out of the swamp. Yoda goes, so certain are you. Always with you, it cannot be done. Hear you nothing I say? Luke goes, Master, moving a stone is one thing. This is totally different. Yoda goes, no different. Only different in your mind. You must unlearn what you have learned. Then Luke goes, all right, I'll give it a try. Yoda goes, no, try not, do, or do not. There is no try. Amen, Yoda. <laughs> little, little provoking right there. So Luke goes over, and of course he's been trying to use the force, you know, to be able to move objects. So he goes over to the, the, the swamp, and, he's, and he gets on over there, and he closes his eyes, and, and he sees the fighter come out of the swamp about two inches, and then go back. And he's just so discouraged. And he just looks at Yoda. And Luke goes, you want the impossible. And he just stalks off. And then you see Yoda go to the edge of the swamp, close his eyes. And he begins to levitate the X-wing fighter, of course, over Luke's head. <laughs> and he takes it like this, puts it down very gently. Luke and all goes, he goes. I don't believe it! And Yoda goes, that's why you fail. Now, as you well know the end of the story, Luke becomes one of the great Jedi Knights. Now, in the midst of this interaction, I think it's true discipling. How often have we failed God? How often has those we've discipled failed? And we feel like Darth Vader. That's the last time you will fail me! You can't be at church on time. <laughs> you missed Bible talk again. Instead of the provoking Yoda, this, no, no, we're not talking about trying right here. Either do or do not. No try. And sometimes our weak brothers and sisters feel that living the Christian life is impossible. And that's when we have to step on in and show them it can be done. Help them overcome the sin that's entangled them. And to carry their burden. And say, yes, you're not only going to make it to heaven, but you're going to do great things on the way. See, that's the difference between being Yoda and Darth Vader. You know, we won't turn to the scriptures because I know that you know them. Paul had to confront his son in the faith, Timothy, with being a coward in his very last letter when he was in jail. He says, Timothy, God has not given you a spirit of timidity, but one of power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the gospel and do not be ashamed of me. Paul dies, he's beheaded. But the next thing that we really know about Timothy in the scriptures comes from the book of Hebrews. And it's Hebrews chapter 13. And the notation by the writer is simply this in verse 23. I want you to know that a brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Timothy, because God and Paul believed in him, lived up to his father's in the faith's expectation. He got tossed in jail. 
He got released. And tradition holds it, and Fox's Book of Martyrs records it, that Timothy, in fact, was martyred when he confronted single-handed a pagan parade that celebrated different aspects of sin. Yep. He was cowardly. He was timid. But Paul never quit believing in him that he would be the man of God that God wanted him to be. And so today, church, I, I really pray that you've heard from the scriptures an upward call to love as Jesus loved. Thank you. God bless.